so blue. Thank you, Lord, for the sparrow that sings and makes me melody for the rivers that flow, the rain and the snow. you've done for me. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord, for making me whole, saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for being a friend. you've done for me. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord, for making me whole, saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me Got a blessing out of that. Amen. Good stuff. Amen. Blessing them. Several different fronts. See that family singing together like that and amen singing that great song. Open your Bible if you would to 1 Kings chapter 11. 1 Kings chapter 11 and I'm glad my sister Debbie's back from Africa over here. She good to see her from her her trip or it was a blessing she got to go, and she was a blessing to a good number of people, and I'm glad she's home. First Kings chapter 11, I want to give an introduction this morning. I told you last Sunday that we were going to be uh, uh, dealing with a, a series of messages here as the Lord would lead, dealing with the period in Bible history known as the divided kingdom. And there's a lot to cover, many lessons and truths to cover, and we won't even pretend uh, to cover them all. Uh, and this morning... You know, just in the way of, of uh, 
in introduction uh, is all we'll probably get done today, uh, but it should make for an interesting, even an educational journey as we go through the Word of God together, this portion of the Bible. And uh, the message today, I want to preach to you on the reason, well, the main reason anyway, uh, behind the divided kingdom. And here in 1 Kings chapter 11, uh, is, this is the obvious text for the message. Looking down at verse 9, uh, 1 Kings chapter 11 verse 9, the Bible says, And the Lord was angry with Solomon, because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice, and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, For as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee, and will give it to thy servant. Notwithstanding, in thy days I will do it for David thy father's. I will not do it for David thy father's sake, but I will rend it out of the hand of thy son. Howbeit I will not rend it away all the kingdom, but will give one tribe to thy son for David my servant's sake, and for Jerusalem's sake which I have chosen. Father, I pray that you'll bless the message this morning, that it'll be helpful, insightful, Lord, as these folks that have gathered here. Uh, Lord, begin to read their Bibles and see some things here in the Scriptures. Uh, Lord, I pray that they'll be able to make personal application uh, from this portion of the Word of God to their life and their families and this church. And uh, Lord God, we're thankful today for the time we have to meet together. Thank you for the Sunday School Hour. Thank you, Lord God, for the privilege to preach. And uh, Lord, I just pray that you'll use me today. Help me, Lord, to help your people. And if there's someone here that's not saved, God, we pray for their soul today. Ask you to remove what blindness may be covering their minds from the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. And we pray, Lord, that they'll be brought to that saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We ask that once again in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible is a history book. Um, uh, people don't question the history of the Bible as much as they used to. Uh, once, uh, you know, they were, there were a number of occasions there where uh, they began to try to question uh, the historical accuracy of the Scripture, and they ended up with egg on their face for doing so. So many times now, they'll even go so far as to try to incorporate the history of the Scriptures into their own uh, historical lessons or their historical agendas that they're trying to prove. But not long ago, the history of the Bible uh, was under great attack, and it was scoffed at. It was ridiculed, commonly uh, corrected with the ideas or really the hypothesis of recognized so-called scholars. And in response to that, there was a cliche that got developed uh, with the idea of defending the Bible. And the cliche, I'm sure you've heard it, is that the Bible is not a history book. Uh, its purpose is not to teach us history. Uh, but then they would add almost as if to, you know, sort of wink at God, give Him an approving nod, a vote of confidence. They said where it speaks, uh, historically it is historically accurate. And uh, as I said, event upon event and situation and claims by the multitudes now have been proven uh, by historical researchers who did not have an agenda. And so today you don't hear as many today mocking the record of the history of the Bible uh, as you used to. Now, however, that weak cliche that got started in defense of the Bible still remains. Uh, let me say this. The Bible is a history book. No matter what anyone else tells you, it's not just a history book, but the history uh, that, uh, as we think about it, it's a record of time. And uh, this book begins at the beginning of time. Uh, it starts with the record there. And then, of course, it reaches out in its record into eternity when time is no more. So it isn't just a history book. It is the most impressive history book that's ever been written. Uh, for some of its history that it has recorded hasn't even happened yet. Now, uh, that's the scenario now. Uh, given enough time, what history the Scriptures have recorded for us that hasn't happened yet will indeed happen uh, just as sure as the history before that has taken place has already taken place. And uh, the writing of prehistory, whenever that does come to pass, that is called fulfilled prophecy. And fulfilled prophecy stands as the single most incredible argument in defense of the inspiration and the preservation of the Scriptures. Now, there are other instances 
places where this has happened. For example, uh, there is much recorded history before it actually took place in the book of Daniel uh, about the events that would take place in regards to the defeat of Persia, the rise of the Grecian Empire, even much about their prominent leader, Alexander, known to us as Alexander the Great. Also there of the de demise, the falling apart, if you will, of the uh, Grecian Empire, leading to the rise of the power of Rome, uh, which of course was in power at the time of Christ's first coming. And that history is so accurate there in the book of Daniel uh, that skeptics long argued uh, that it wasn't even written when it was uh, proposed to have been written. Uh, they even claimed that Daniel did not exist, uh, that he was an invented character, someone living during the times following the fall of the Grecian Empire, wrote about all of it, and then pretended that it was written before it all happened. And they said that they then attributed that that they wrote to this fictional character that they invented named Daniel. And these skeptics, they, they wrote and based their objections on what? Well, here's what they said, quote, It is not conceivable that someone could write with such details about world events that had not happened yet. Now, that was what they based their objection on. They based their objection on the fact that it wasn't conceivable that someone could write with such detail. Then through archaeological findings, they proved Daniel did exist and that he was a prominent part in the Babylonian Empire, as the Bible says, that he played a prominent role in the Persian Empire, as the Bible said, and that his name he was called by matched the historical, uh, the, the historical record that you find in Scripture. And then backing up and realizing that, uh, that the last half of the book of the Bible Bible is the prophetical section uh, of the uh, book of Daniel, and that Daniel penned that, this historical man penned uh, that material that they're referring to there, uh, you begin to realize, or at least you should, uh, just what an amazing prophecy the book of Daniel possesses. And of those whose entire objections was based upon how highly impossible it would have been for this Daniel to even exist and, and how that uh, he could not have written uh, with such detail about the things he wrote about, uh, what do they say now? Well, uh, here's what they did. They just quit talking about it. <laughs> That's the way they did it. <laughs> they just quit talking about it. Nothing was said about the information and the details concerning uh, Persia and Greece. Nothing is said about that. They just quit speaking about it because you see, if you begin to research it, you begin to realize what a book you're holding in your hand this morning called the Word of God. And that's just one example, the book of Daniel as a whole. There, the, the Bible prophecy proves, it proves to be pre-written history. And there are tons of examples to be cited. Uh, just to mention a few here from the book of Isaiah, anyone can check this out uh, using uh, the method of, of mathematical probability. The laws of probability means this, you calculate uh, the likelihood of several events taking place in or near uh, the same event of time there, and, and the probabilities have to be multiplied together. In, in other words, uh, if the probability of a single event occurring randomly is one chance in five, and the probability of a separate event taking place there is one chance in ten. Then the probability of both of those events occurring together in the sequence is a, is a one in five multiplied by a one in ten chance, and that yields one chance in fifty. All right, now that's just the, the laws of probability. Now, in considering the fact that several different prophets lived in several communities there in two kingdoms over a span of a thousand years. They made prophecy or predictions of Christ at least 500 years before His birth. The odds of those prophecies coming true are simply, folks, beyond our comprehension. They're beyond our, our uh, wildest imagination. Uh, for example, the chances of one man, Jesus, fulfilling just eight Someone did the math. Don't worry about it. I didn't do the math this morning. Someone else did the math. The chances of this one man, Jesus, fulfilling just eight of the prophecies attributed to him are one chance in ten to the seventeenth power. That is the, the number one with uh, the number ten with seventeen zeros after it. Now, now you, I throw that out there this morning. You say, wow, but we don't even begin to fathom what a great number that is. Uh, somebody did this scientifically there. They, they said this, imagine covering the entire state of Texas with silver dollar pieces. Covering the entire state of Texas with silver dollar pieces to a level of two feet deep. 
the number of silver dollar pieces needed to cover the whole state would be 10 to the 17th power. That's how great that number is. Now imagine somebody flying overhead of that, if that was done, and dropping a silver dollar piece that had been marked with the letter X and dropped it down there over the state of Texas somewhere as the whole state of Texas is covered with these silver dollar pieces two feet deep and they drop this one silver dollar piece that is marked X and then you take somebody and you blindfold them and you send them out to the state of Texas. You say you can start anywhere, you can walk anywhere all over the state of Texas but you need to pick that one silver dollar piece blindfolded in a chance just pick that one silver dollar piece that is marked X. What are the chances that anybody can do such a thing? Now, folks, that is 10 to the 17th power. That's how great that number is. That's only if he fulfilled eight of those prophecies. There are 48 prophecies he fulfilled in the book of Isaiah alone. Now, oh, that number there, as you think about that, uh, 48 prophecies in the book of Isaiah uh, in the first advent, written well over 700 years before they happened, using the laws of probability equates to one chance out of the number 10 to the 157th power. Now, that, that's the number 10 with 157 zeros after it. There are over 300 prophecies fulfilled about the first coming of Christ in the whole Old Testament. Now what that means is this, that according to Bible history and according to fulfilled prophecy figured by mathematical probability, the fact that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, is the single most likely event that ever happened in history. Amen. Now that's a fact. Now, that, that's Isaiah's prophecy of Christ that has already been fulfilled, not to mention the ones that are going to be fulfilled, but uh, also, too, uh, the book, Isaiah goes so far as to, to name a Gentile king before his kingdom even appeared on the scene. And then, of course, uh, the surrounding nations around uh, the nation of Israel, it gives specific prophecy about them, not to mention the history and the futures of the people of, of Israel and Judah that are given in detail in the book of Isaiah. See, the Bible, someone wants to do away with the Bible, and they just say, well, it's just a religious document. And then, in that straw man argument, all they have to do is just discard all men's religion. And that's pretty easily done. I mean, when you think about all the religious systems and the different opinions and the wild things that people believe, and you can just easily just throw off on all religion as a blanket statement, and if you could just reduce this Bible to just a religious document, you may influence somebody. But the Bible's not just a religious document. I mean, the Holy Scriptures themselves discard man's religion. <laughs> And so you can't do it all together. And, and this is an inspired compilation of 66 books. Two testaments made between God to man there. It is the God-breathed treaties on the sinfulness of man and his desperate need spiritually. It is the revelation of God. It is framing the message of redemption we must hear, uh, rolling out the introduction to the one true Redeemer, detailing uh, the, the finished work of redemption He accomplished on our behalf. The Bible you hold in your hand this morning, if you brought it to church, it identifies sin. It defines what sin is. It gives full disclosure as to the problem sin has wrought in all the world, including the balance of nature that is upset because the ground has been cursed. The Bible de explains death, it explains disease, it explains sickness and suffering. It gives stark condemnation to all idolatry and defines idolatry from the worship and the adoration of foreign gods made with men's hands or invented in man's imagination right down to the worshiping himself that man will do in honoring himself as his own God living a life of covetousness which the Bible says is idolatry. The Bible offers an inspired insight to the subject of social studies.
It uh, presents mathematical wonders. It explains geology, talks about the cultures, both then and now. It's a book of science. There are great scientific facts presented in the Bible. It gives insight to athletics and competition, speaks to health, speaks of financial decisions, the importance of financial integrity, shows the steps necessary in framing character or reforming character, explains marriage, defines what marriage is, even serves as a marriage manual for us. It explains the wonders of childbirth, the responsibilities of raising children, defines the rights and wrongs of parenting. And yes, besides all that, the Bible's a history book. And, and if anyone ever goes against the history of the Bible, don't cower down. Don't, don't get the attitude of trying to make apologies and step back away from those that would attack the record of the words of the living God. <laughs> Just assume they're wrong. Amen. <laughs> when it comes to history, they weren't there. Man. And in many cases, when the Bible records history, it's recorded by men who were there. They were eyewitness uh, in many instances who were there. And besides that, in its original source, uh, the author is omniscient. Man. And he cannot lie. Man. And he's never been wrong. Amen. And the truth is, no matter who criticizes the Bible, they have been wrong. <laughs> Amen. And, and they do lie. <laughs> Amen. All men do. Amen. And, and so they have an agenda and they try to push it. Now, the history of the Bible is relevant history. It's significant history. Its history concerns God's dealings with man and man's accountability to God. Uh, it, it is a history that trumpets both the first advent of Christ and the second advent of Jesus Christ. And the histories recorded in Scripture at times, uh, they show uh, wars and, and uh, disgraced heroes and repented villains and, and gives numbers to casualties that are fought in several military encounters and shows the history of mankind, like it or not, involves a little more than men killing other men and committing all other uh, unimaginable atrocities. Jesus, speaking about the ministry of John the Baptist, talks about government, and here's what he said. He says, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven, listen, suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Again, he's speaking about the subject of literal government, earthly power, the right to govern, and says, quote, the violent take it by force. You want history? <laughs> You check your Bible. Man. It's not going to give you the dates of the Ming Dynasty or the Goths and the Visigoths and their battles of the Saxons and Normans and all that, but the real truth that's relevant to your life that you would find out in researching those other type histories about man's nature and the, the wars they lost and the wars they fought there and the ultimate reason behind their battles and wars is the ultimate reason behind all the battles and wars that are fought today. And they're going to continue to be fought until the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the issue is authority. Man. That's it. They fight and kill over authority no matter the cause stated. Bottom line is it's always about authority. Right. Who's in charge? Who's telling who what to do and who's listening? Who's in control? Therefore, the supreme subject of the Scriptures as a whole is about a kingdom. It's about a throne. It's about authority. And the information that God gives, it's a, if it's arranged chronologically, begins with the throne. I mean, and you look at that history there as it follows on and culminates where? Around that throne. If you go from Isaiah 14 where the curtain's pulled back and it's... You understand there that it's speaking about Lucifer and his fall and the covetousness he had for the throne of God right up until Revelation chapter 22 into eternity in future. The Bible says there in Revelation 22, He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. One verse later he says, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him. Hey, considering man's preoccupation about himself and about his quote-unquote fellow man and the never-ending conquest uh, as far as governmental relationships, it's surprising that he hasn't discovered long ago the subject of the Bible, dealing with authority, a throne, and a kingdom. 
Uh, it's strange. The Bible would be overlooked by man while he struggles to rule others <laughs> or break away from those that are ruling and oppressing him and, and trying to maintain his independence and submit to other alliances. You want to know history? This is kind of bleak. This is kind of dark. But here it is. History, it turns out, is the record of man, quote unquote, reaching forward, <laughs> killing his fellow man <laughs> in order to establish a government where he does not have to kill his fellow man. <laughs> That's the history of man right there. It is man so-called reaching forward, killing his fellow man to attain a government where he does not have to kill his fellow man. And all the historical moralizing, apart from those facts, is academic. You just look at the battlefields. As one man said, the battlefields speak for themselves. You can have Roosevelt standing over corpses, and you can have Lincoln standing over corpses, moralizing what's taking place. But who are you going to listen to? Are you going to listen to the politician, or are you going to listen to the corpses he's standing over? Amen? Amen. Amen. I know. All these great speeches and so forth, these men made after the battles and what have you, you know, it's, it's great. Imagine if you were a corpse there on that battlefield and you were able to listen to some of those great speeches about the good of man and all the intentions, the do good, all that stuff they're trying to, to get you to believe after the battle's been fought. You know what man wants today? <laughs> I'll tell you what he wants. He wants the same thing they wanted in Genesis chapter 11. They want to build the kingdom without the king. That's what man wants. They want the benefits of Christ without Christ. Uh, they want the blessings of righteousness without righteousness. Man, as I was mentioning in the Bible Institute this morning, he's intuitively religious. He's going to involve himself in some type of worship. He wants to be religious. But what he doesn't want is righteousness. And he doesn't want authority. He doesn't want anyone telling him what to do. You know what man wants? He wants peace without the Prince of Peace. He wants the blessings of righteousness without righteousness. Human governments want control and peace under their control, and they want it so bad, their idea of peace under their control, they'll kill millions to get it. Folks, that's the facts. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That's the facts. And again, there might be someone saying, well, that's pretty cynical. Well, the facts are not only evident in history itself. This is a foundational truth of Scripture. Man is a sinner. He's a sinner who wants to live in paradise without ever having to get right with God. That's man at his base. So no matter what approach a man takes in politics or human government, without the true authority of God's Word and His throne, it always ends up in carnage. Those are the facts. Those have been the facts for 6,000 years. And you can have a dreamy idea, an idealist, you know, about peace and people trying to bring in peace. People don't bring in peace. Amen. People create wars and kill each other. That's our history since Cain knocked Abel's brains out. Amen. Amen. Now, uh, you try to separate the God of history from the God of the Bible, it can't be done. The God of history is the God of revelation. And, uh, and the fact is that man's going to try to unite to bring in unity and peace. It always ends up in prison camps, cycle wards, riots, revolutions, civil wars, battlefields, grave markers. That's history, man's history, past, present, and future. Here in the book of the Bible, these books known as First and Second Kings, obviously you know what we're going to be dealing with? We're going to be dealing with the subject of authority and thrones with kings coming and going. Then you add to that First and Second Samuel, which was also historically referred to as the kings in history. Used to they had First Kings, Second Kings, Third Kings, and Fourth Kings, and then you had First and Second Chronicles to boot. Historical books of Scripture eventually dealing with two kingdoms: the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. Near forty different rulers, different dynasties. God periodically sends in His prophets to steer men towards righteousness and warn them of upcoming judgment. And all that's relevant to us how? All these things that's recorded in First and Second Kings. Well, here they are. I'll just throw them out. I'm not preaching these this morning. But here they are. One, the matter of the authority of God and the importance of obedience and the ability to submit. Amen. Those are Christian virtues. <laughs> the ability to submit. I realize that just is like a lead balloon this morning talking to a bunch of independent Baptist friends, but that's New Testament doctrine. 
the importance of the authority of God and obedience and the ability to submit. Now, second of all, the fact of sin's dominion and the truth of offered freedom from its authority. Third, how once we're free, the Bible says, we're no longer under the law. We're no longer under the law, but what? We are under grace. We were not without authority just because we're saved. It's just we're no longer under the law. But we are under grace. Fourth, the importance of being able to rule your own spirit. In a day and time when men are described as being incontinent, without the ability to control themselves, the Bible admonishes you and I to be able to rule our own spirit. Fifth, the God-ordained order of the powers that be, the establishment of the church, and the God-ordained order of the home. Six, the eventual collapse of all human authority in government. And seventh, the final government of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. These are all just highlighting the things that are going to de we're going to be dealing with as we look at this period of the divided kingdom. And it all boils down to this, whether or not a man will obey God's authority or not. Uh, from the moment God delegated to man dominion. What's that mean? That means He gave him charge. He gave him responsibility. He gave him a position of leadership. And the, the moment he gave him authority and gave him rule, still yet above all that, God gave what? A commandment. Adam, you're over everything. You're